So could the director is a very active scientist and he received his PhD from National University of Singapore and is a young and very active scientist in the quantum technology fields. And he worked uh, on some interesting projects there in cube satellite projects after his graduation. And uh, he worked on some quantum crypto cryptography and the satellites. But today we are going to ask for three cell entanglements as a resource for communication and sensing. So let's welcome. Um, thanks for the nice introduction and thanks for this organization. Um, I'll talk about entanglement in general as a resource for communication and sensing. Uh, most of my talk is going to be about experiment. Okay, uh, I'll just make some brief introductions to the uh, concepts uh, before I proceed, uh, which has been already repeated a couple of times, but I'll just proceed with the presentation. So uh, there are two magic of quantum mechanics that cannot be, well, uh, that the, there is no counterpart in classical physics, which is superposition and entanglement. Uh, I will talk about them in a while, but uh, there's this question I keep getting uh, from Richard Feynman. If you understand quantum mechanics, then you know nothing. So we don't understand anything, we are in the right path. So that's not true. So what he meant was like, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't find the correspondence of the quantum mechanics laws in our daily experiences. So that's what he meant, not that we don't understand. Of course we understand, we do something with, it, with them. So, but they do not fit into our daily experiences. So uh, this is from the uh, Solveig conference. Uh, Zafiro just showed about it. Uh, so what is uh, Schrodinger's equation? It's just a mathematical equation. What is the interpretation of it? Uh, Max Born uh, interpreted as the following way. So there's a wave function. It's the modulus square of the wave function. Let's see this is the position. It can be any other parameter, but I'm just going to give the example of position. So this uh, modulus square of this function, or multiplication with the conjugate, gives you the probability of this particle to be at certain point. So if you want to find the probability of the f a particle to be found between A and B, you just integrate this, and then that gives you the probability. Of course, this is statistical. So quantum mechanics is just combining the linear algebra and the uh, uh, statistical mechanics. So statistically, it, it tells you where the particle is. Everything is fine so far. The big question of quantum mechanics, well, by the way, these answers are from, I got some rejection, uh, sorry, uh, some complaint about this slide. Previously, so this is from Griffith, the most famous quantum physics book. You can find the introduction chapter. So the biggest problem of quantum mechanics is, okay, well, there's a probability wave function. You make the measurement, you do the measurement, then the particle exists in one, pla one point, determined by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Everything is fine. So the question that was discussed in Solvay conference was, where was the particle just before the measurement? The first uh, answer, which is the most uh, understandable one, is. It was somewhere, you just didn't know it because the wave function didn't tell you. Maybe the theory is not complete. The second answer is, uh, it was not anywhere. It did not possess some well-defined position. So it was just spreading among, uh, along this axis with some probability. It, well, so the, the, this one is very important. I mean, it's not that it was somewhere, we didn't know it, that's why we had the probability. Classically, that's what we understand. No, actually the particle was not possessing or occupying as uh, specific position. It was everywhere, or defined by this wave function. The third one is uh, agnostic stand. So you're just asking, where would you see the particle? Uh, if you measure the particle before you measure the particle, where would it be? So that doesn't make sense. So uh, it doesn't, it's not a scientific question. So Pauli was uh, supporting this idea. Paul Dirac was uh, supporting this idea. And Einstein was supporting this idea. Interestingly, the most craziest one became the <laughs> right, uh, right answer. So. Of course, Einstein didn't want to uh, uh, accept the idea, and then he made this ERP uh, paradox. He talked about this ERP paradox with his colleagues. So basically, he was just trying to show that it doesn't make sense if the particle was not, well, sorry, prior to the measurement, the particle did not possess this parameter that the wave function carries. That doesn't make sense. It occupied, or it had this parameter, we just didn't know it. So for this one, you just got this uh, uh, spin zero particle. It's some radius two particles, uh, spin half spin off particles, then since the angular momentum has to be conserved, one of the conservation laws, if one of them is up, the other one has to be down, and vice versa. And then the experiment is like, if you take this particle like really far away, okay, then uh, you do a measurement, you find it is up. But since both particles did not have this property, the other one 
the answer is already known, right? Since we know the, uh, this part, what this particle spin was, the, the other one is already known. But how did this particle know what was this one? Because they did not occupy a certain spin, right? Prior to the measurement. So it, because the distance is so far that it would take uh, lots of time, so, uh, and the, the ultimate speed is speed of, speed of light. So it doesn't make sense. Then there is some spooky action happening in midfin. That's why he said this spooky action at a distance, this, this famous word. So then I, uh, Schrodinger uh, talked about this entanglement state. This is introduction to entanglement idea. So he just put this cat. I'm not going to talk about this further. But uh, so that was the classical uh, way of picturing the uh, entanglement. So if the atomic uh, particle radiates, uh, the cat is dead, and vice versa. So that's an entangled state. So then uh, later on. Uh, uh, John Bell in 1965, he proposed this Bell equation, uh, uh, sorry, violation of Bell's inequality, proven that the quantum mechanics is correct. Uh, at least uh, there are no local hidden variables. That's what that uh, experiment says. It has been verified since then, experimentally. We can also verify this in our laboratory. The violation of Bell's inequality tells us that the part uh, particles are entangled. So the correlations are not classical. And the particle did not have the local realism of having this certain spin prior to the measurement. So it was actually in the superposition of this state. So uh, that, that's the basic theory about why people are spending so much money, how much money. We are talking about big monies. I mean, like over 40 billion over, uh, uh, across the world. So this was like 2015 from European uh, Commission report. So look, uh, please look at the numbers. And now these are the after numbers, like, like 2018 and 2019. These are the updates. So it's exponentially increasing, just like the quantum computation speed. So exponentially increasing how much people spend money. Why? It's because uh, it's useful for some defense stuff. So <laughs> that's where the money is, I think. Um, the Schwarz algorithm in 1995, it talks about uh, finding the prime factors of large numbers, which was used for cryptographic schemes. So, and uh, NSA is the, one of the biggest uh, providers of these cryptographic suits. And usually they give, they say, few decades here. Uh, but actually, 30 years, they provide the guarantee that no one can break the code uh, within 30 years. But here, in this question answer uh, announcement, which was, which was published in 2015, they said, well, we cannot promise that anymore, sorry. So you, you have to be careful about the quantum computers. If somebody like uh, confidentially get this quantum computer, we don't know about it. So that's why there's no more uh, guarantee that you know 30 years for the next 30 years our cryptographic suits are safe. So that was the first warning. Some more warnings came afterwards. So IBM uh, half uh, advertisement, half some actual uh, uh, warning. They said like move your data today. So get do something, otherwise the quantum, quantum computers are coming. And here we are. So into the like this is very recent. 23rd October. Uh, this is the uh, Google's uh, quantum supremacy paper. So, uh, what is the answer uh, for uh, uh, quantum computer assisted attacks? It's quantum cryptography. I will talk about it in a while, like why that's the answer. There are two types of cryptographic uh, protocols, like symmetric and asymmetric ones. Asymmetric one, ones are usually called public key cryptography, they, they rely on this prime factorization problem or discrete logarithm. So symmetric keys are uh, relatively secure against the quantum computer assisted attacks. Uh, but the, the, the key cannot be used forever. Once we get the key, we cannot use for encryption forever. We have to renew the key. Otherwise, there will be some dictionary attack, which means they try to get some patterns out of uh, encrypted messages. So it's not. Then basically, if you use this as, uh, symmetrical uh, protocols, which are secure against the quantum computer, then you need to keep providing keys to two parties for secure communication, which is a problem. So uh, this is an example uh, of if you want to deliver the keys by people, usually either agents or spies, or uh, banks are using uh, couriers for giving the hard drive to the uh, client. So if you use such a thing, then first, there is still some security uh, problem. Second, well, banks are using right now like that. But if the public keys are not used anymore, then a certain po uh, percentage of the population, the world's population, has to be either agents or couriers, which doesn't make sense. So that's not realistic. So some uh, uh, solution is needed here. Symmetric cryptography works like this. Uh, this is the, like, let's say these two parties want to communicate securely. Uh, they want to share a secret message. And then uh, the encryption and decryption protocols, sorry, algorithms, are well known. 
So AES, DES, uh, and all the other algorithms are very well known. You can find online, and then you can use your own computer. So the, the, the security is relying on the key. The key is how you jumble these uh, uh, characters to make it encrypted. And uh, the, the security of the key relies on secrecy and the randomness of uh, uh, the two party keys. Here, the key used by the part A and part B are the same. One of them is using for encryption, the other one is using for decryption. So secrecy is very important here. We just seen one example here uh, can be captured. So how do we deliver the key for symmetric cryptographic suits? So quantum key distribution is the solution for this one. Asymmetric ones are using something like this. There's a repository, OK? So you just apply for uh, keys. They provide you some prime numbers. Then once they uh, announce certain number, the two parties, part A and part B, they know which key they, they need to use. OK? So and by a third party here, let's say we heard the, what is the, uh, the large number they uh, announced. Since it's very fine, uh, difficult to find the two prime factors of, let's say, 500-digit number, uh, then it takes like longer time than compared to the human lifespan. So that's why like the, this cryptographic suit is called, uh, protocol is called secure. But then you have to trust the repository, and the computing difficulty is the key here. If this uh, prime factorization can be found, then, then it's not secure anymore. So there, uh, if you choose to continue with the symmetrical protocols, then entanglement works really good. I will not talk about the other protocols, the, the, the BB84 protocol, prepare and measurement pro protocols. Entanglement-based uh, protocol can be used like this. There's an entangled source, photon source, let's say. Well, I like sources. I know some theoreticians uh, call it fake uh, entanglement, but uh, they are really useful for communication and some other purposes. Because uh, uh, you can uh, you can make them travel in space without losing their information. So you send uh, one photon here, the other photon here, and then the polarization measure basis here somehow determines the outcome of uh, here. OK, so there's a correlation. Uh, you can use this for uh, sharing a secret key. OK, uh, and it is secure because eventually you check what was the polarization information by checking the violation of Bell's inequality. If you violate the Bell's inequality, then you know that they are the legitimate photons used for the other party. You know that they are the actual twin photons. OK, but how do we create these entangled photons? Let me talk about the spontaneous parametric down conversion process. So there's a nonlinear crystal. It's a chi-2 uh, crystal. You just send some pump beam, some high-frequency beam, and then one out of 10 to 11. Well, I'm telling this number, but I think that theory has to be rearranged. I'll talk about it later on. So one out of 10 to power of 11 number of photons split into two lower-frequency photons. That's why it's called down conversion. The energy is reduced for the down converted photons. They are called signal and idler photons. And their energy and momentum has to be conserved. And that's a typical setup how you can uh, achieve entangled photons here. There's a laser source here, fluorescence filter, halfway plate for setting the polarization. Uh, the cross-configured uh, uh, beta barium borate crystals, which is what we use in the laboratory. Uh, and then we put them with a dark rig mirror, we filter the blue light. So after this point, only entangled photons exist. OK, there are some uh, phase compensation and spatial compensation crystals to make them actually entangled and increase the fidelity. We use this kind of crystals. <laughs> then we send them for whatever you want to do, communication or any other purposes. So this, these are the parameters that we use in our laboratory. So these are the wavelengths. We use four or five nanometer blue light. We send it to the beta barium borate crystal. And then uh, uh, we filter the blue light. And the signal and idler photons having 780 nanometer and 842 nanometer. How do we choose this? Uh, the, the angle of the crystal. So the, the crystal is growth in one axis. When you cut the crystal, you choose certain axis so that uh, it gives you this uh, wavelength. That's called the phase matching condition. But there are two types of phase, phase matching for uh, uh, achieving entangled photons, uh, critical versus non-critical. Non-critical is you lock the temperature of this device, uh, this, this crystal, so that the wavelengths of the photons are well defined. But this, this is usually like less than 0.1 degree. Uh, uh, stabilization of the temperature is required. And for the other one, the laser beam that you send to the crystal should be like really nicely aligned. Even small angle deviations change the uh, uh, entanglement fidelity, or let's say the quality of the entanglement. How do we understand this? This is a curve that I got like, I don't know, five years ago or something. Um, so if you look at this red one here uh, at this point, or let's say the, 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 the black points, the visibility, the quality of the entanglement is peak. 
at zero angle position. From there, we just detune the angle of the either laser beam or the crystal and see how, how the, the entanglement fidelity goes down. As you see here, like around like uh, 100 micro radians, plus minus 100 micro radians, you're losing a couple of percent fidelity. So the entanglement quality is going down. So you have to lock uh, uh, the, sorry, the, the laser beam that you send to the crystal has to be really nicely adjusted. If you just change even 100 micro radians, then you lose your entanglement which is very critical, if, especially if you want to do some space-based quantum key distribution stuff. That's why we wanted to use beta barium barat crystal instead of this periodically polled uh, crystals, like PPKTP or like some other ones. So these periodically polled crystals, they are, they are richer, they are brighter uh, in terms of their creation of entangled uh, number of entangled photon numbers. But uh, since it requires some temperature locking, it's not suitable for space. How are we going to temperature stabilize uh, certain components because what we do here is usually use some Peltier element or thermoelectric coolers so there are two parallel plates you just apply some voltage one plate is getting cold the other one is getting hot and then the hot one you just dissipate the energy to the atmosphere the gas molecules getting the energy you design a nice heat sink then effectively you're cooling it down but there's no atmosphere in space well at least the the the, the not enough, like 10 to the minus uh, 6 to 10 to the minus 8 millibar pressure is not enough for having a, a thermoelectric cooler. Then what you can do is like you make some large uh, radiative dishes. Recently I've seen some uh, experiment uh, from Russia. So they just made this large dish. So they radiatively, by sending some uh, black, body uh, ra black body radiation photons, you're dissipating the energy, which is not that efficient. So that's why like beta barium borate, this critical uh, phase matching is useful for us. And this is a setup uh, where we want to make a compact uh, entangled photon source and send to space and then perform some uh, uh, quantum experiments on them. So these are the, the, the first part that I just shown here, like beta barium barite crystals, phase compensation crystals. Here we split the wavelength, signal and idler goes different ways, and there are polarizers here. And these polarizers, the angle that uh, between these two polarizers are the interferometer, quantum interference. We are talking about quantum interference. Basically, this entanglement test is a, a quantum interference test. So by changing the polarization angle between these two, relative uh, angle this, uh, difference between these two polarizers sets from minus two, in the Bell state, minus two uh, uh, plus state. Uh, so but basically, you can determine if it's a constructive or destructive quantum interference by doing this. Uh, so we wanted to do this test in space. So that was the uh, experimental layout. And then the idea is miniaturizing it to the like, like something like credit card uh, dimensions and put in a, a satellite and send to space and then send the photons to Earth and see if the correlations are kept in space. Uh, like around three years of uh, work, we miniaturized the quantum entangled photon source, which is inside this black part. And the driving circuitry is behind this, uh, behind, well, this is just upside down. So these are the driving circuit circuitry for that. And these are the dimensions and everything. Like it's pretty small and we were able to operate the source, uh, including the detect detectors with a nine volt uh, uh, remote uh, control battery. So, and like lots of testing. So if it can survive uh, uh, during the launch to the space. So we successfully uh, miniaturized it, make a compact source. And then like we want to have some launch trials. First a balloon test, some better uh, weather balloons goes up like 35 to uh, 40 kilometers. It exploded in 35 kilometers. That was published. It was successful. The second one, uh, uh, NASA's rocket exploded in 2015. Uh, that, that, that's the picture of it. And that was the satellite. Uh, and the third one uh, is successful. But this one somehow uh, was, uh, is a more famous paper than the successful one because uh, usually like if you talk about entangled photons, like don't breathe, don't get too close, you're too hot, so you will change the temperature and then like the alignments will be gone, something like that. So usually like extra uh, measures are taken so that you know the, the, the entanglement properties are kept. But here like it goes up like 200 degrees and like uh, G, like an acceleration of around 40, uh, 54 G, which was a huge explosion and it survived through this uh, explosion. Well, when we first seen this, uh, we got the news from NASA that you know it, it survived. Uh, the first reaction of the professor was accident in an accident. <laughs> but later on, we realized that actually it was over-engineered. We over-engineered the uh, uh, source. Uh, and that's the layout of the source. I'll not talk about this in detail. So then we want to uh, improve the source. Uh, how do we improve the source? 
uh, we can increase the entanglement quality, which is the entanglement fidelity. We can have co uh, improve the collection optics. We can have more entangled photons in per, per second. And the collection efficiency and the uh, uh, brightness will improve uh, the, the rate for the quantum key distribution if you have uh, your source in satellite. So there was a paper here, as you see here, we had this model where this Volkov of the pump beam, 4 or 5 nanometer, and this is the collection of these. The overlap region determines the entangled photon shape. As you see here, uh, we were expecting, for signal in idler, we were expecting some peaks like this, the spectrum like this, uh, because the crystal was long here. This was a 15 millimeter crystal, but experimentally we got this yellow curve. The reason for that is we said that, okay, maybe the, the, the length is long, but we are collecting from a very limited uh, part of it. But apparently, this was a wrong picture. So unfortunately, <laughs> I wrote the paper. But so, because uh, well, two years ago I uh, came to Turkey. I came to Istanbul. So we wanted to see the entangled photons. Maybe if we can see the entangled photons with a camera, a regular camera, we can actually tailor how the mode shape looks like, and then we can have more entangled photons. That was the idea. So then we first calibrated the camera. Uh, well, it's just, just just a regular camera. I mean. Uh, I got it from Sarkanoja. I don't know where he is, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, calibration means just take a, a subtract the dark, uh, dark uh, current of the camera and remove the background, either switching of the, of the light or uh, putting extra, like, uh, strong filters. So basically, it works linear as long as uh, it was an 8-bit camera. Uh, as long as you don't go to exceed this number, 255, it's perfectly linear. So then you can use it like a power meter to see the entangled photons. And here, how it looks like. So basically, if you look at this picture, if you remember the, uh, OK, so the uh, pump beam goes like this. And if you change the crystal angle, we designed everything for a collinear regime. So signal and idle photons go in the same way. If you change, rotate the crystal angle, they will change their di direction. Then you will see, because of the circular symmetry, you will see this donut shape. And then if you change, rotate the crystal angle, the, the, the circle is going to be having a larger and smaller diameter. So here we have two crystals, cross correlation. When they perfectly overlap, we have the entangled state, because they have to be indistinguishable. So that's how it looks like on the camera. What we are doing is just changing the angle of these two crystals. The coloring is added later on. It's not the actual color. It's just like uh, some black and white uh, image. But we had to take out the infrared filter from the camera. So when these two circles perfectly overlap, they have this entangled state. Normally, there's Volkov, but because of these compensation crystals, they can perfectly overlap. OK, how do we stop this? OK, so we now can see the uh, mode shape with the camera. How do we continue? Uh, first of all, the, in the literature, there are papers saying that you cannot collect the photons, uh, all the entangled photons, to single mode fiber. And that follows this, uh, if, if this, the crystal length is L, L to the power of uh, 1 over, uh, uh, sorry, square root L. It just goes with square root L, something like this. We also seen like this. I mean, if you couple the entangled photons into single mode fiber, we realize that it goes like this. But with the camera, it goes linear. It's supposed to be linear. Because we know that it's the chi 2 effect, which means it, the, the, the power of the number of the entangled photons goes with the, linearly with the intensity of the light, which is the square of the electric field. But we cannot collect them to a the, uh, single mode fiber. Then we want to understand if what we see that makes sense or not. So the, the crystal that we cut was like 28.8 uh, degree crystal cut. That's actually 0 degree when you go to normal to the crystal. And then we just change the angle of the crystal. And that's the angle of the crystal. And this is the signal and idler wavelengths uh, conserving the momentum of the uh, uh, down conversion process. But here we realize something. I mean, there's no elliptical mode shape, which exists in almost everywhere in the literature. We didn't see that. So this, what we see on the camera, the, our analysis doesn't fit to the literature. Let me talk about this. I mean, these are some of the papers. Uh, that you can see the mode shape, like the, the, this is the Volkov of the pump, because extraordinary beam. Birefringent crystals work like this. If you send an extraordinary beam, even if you go normal, it def gets deflected. That's called Volkov. But the ordinary polarized beam, it just goes like, uh, like uh, travel the, without changing the angle. As you see here, Volkov is uh, changing the uh, 
while the pumping changing the uh, direction, but entangled photons are still having the ordinary axis here. You can see this picture almost everywhere. Uh, there are some other examples, uh, like respected journals here. But the problem here is, uh, well, we, we don't see that in the camera. Five minutes. Uh, OK, when we get back to the theory, we realize that there is something wrong. OK, ordinary axis is well defined, but uh, the entangled photons should follow the momentum of the pump beam, which means uh, even if you give some angle, uh, uh, if you have this non-collinear geometry, uh, it has to be cylindrically symmetrical around the pump beam. That explains this. So I think this, uh, there's one correction this part, but I will rush a little bit because I'm running out of time. So when we change the crystal angle, we realize that there's some asymmetry coming out. I mean, you can see it from this picture as well. So there's an asymmetrical shape here. The reason for that is because we could focus the pump and because of the Snell's law at the very simple explanation. We were really looking deep, but we realized it's just Snell's law. Uh, that prevents us uh, coupling uh, the entangled photons into single mode fiber. So now we have a really bright source. How bright? Uh, something like this. We have 10.4 million pairs per second and uh, per milliwatt input power. And uh, we can collect like around half a million uh, photon, entangled photons into single mode fiber per milliwatt. Again, if you send like 100 milliwatt of, of pump power, then it's going to be 100 times. It's extremely bright. The best value that we and I know of, I know of so far is 96k, 96,000 entangled photon pairs per second with beta barium borate crystals. I'm talking about single pass, not a, a cavity case. So we have a really bright source. What do we do with them? We talked about, uh, and then there's this famous thing that uh, people were asking me, like, is that actually real or not? the quantum radar uh, news about China. So they just have, uh, uh, this is their explanation, by the way. They have the entangled photons, and they just keep one of them with an optical delay, and then measure it, and then keep the information, and then send the other one with a search uh, telescope to see what is coming backwards, and then they check the uh, entanglement correlations. If it's the legit photon, they can understand how much is the delay of this photon. From there, they can understand the distance. That was the basic idea. They said like they had this from 100 kilometers, uh, but there are some uh, different ideas about this news. Some people say it's really important. I mean, like they get this, and then some people say don't buy that. I mean, it's not possible. So I wanted to test if it's possible or not, because we have really bright source. So we wanted to see if we send entangled photons, are they actually coming back or not? So that was the experimental setup. Here in this experimental setup, in this one, in this result, we just looked at the time correlations and uh, uh, not the entanglement properties, but we can also check the uh, Bell's, Bell's, Bell's inequality, violation of Bell's inequality, that tells us if the photons are coming to our detector, are the legit photons or some, somebody's trying to fool us or not. That's one of the advantages of uh, quantum radar, let's say. By the way, when I say radar, there's a radio term here that pieces off uh, the, the radar people, but, well, I don't know what to say, that's why I'm using this term. But this is not in ra uh, microwave frequencies, this is in uh, optical and, and uh, near infrared band. So, but that tells us actually the photons can be used for this uh, business or not. So what we do is pretty much the same as what you see in the Chinese paper. So we just uh, split the entangled photons, signal goes this way, we just uh, record the time, timing information of these photons and then send the other one with the telescope. And then if any photons are bouncing backwards, we collect with the same telescope and then they go upwards now because there's a quarter wave plate here. And then we look at the time correlations here, and then uh, when we have the cross-correlation function, with a certain delay, we see a peak at the coincidences. So that tells us what is the extra path that these idler photons traveled with respect to the signal ones. And they are moving with the speed of light. That tells us what is the distance of this object. So that is, uh, here, here's the preprint for that. So this is, like basically, I went up to like 1.25 meters here, but now we can go up to four meters. That's pretty much the limit we can have in our laboratory. So this is the experimental setup. It goes down with the one over r square. R is the distance with object and the uh, source. So it goes this way. Uh, and the cross correlator uh, looks like this. I mean, like if you have one object far away, you get something backwards, and then we get this one. If you put something like side to it, like with a different distance, you will see something like this. And then here, it's the time axis, how much is the time? So one nanosecond, no, three nanosecond means something like one meter. 3.3 .3 nanosecond, yeah, so. 
So because it's moving with the speed of light. So this delay tells us where the object is. So if you put two objects, you will see like where the, what the positions are. So basically, we can use these entangled photons for seeing them. Uh, uh, the, photo, the entangled photons we used here are like uh, near infrared photons. So then we made some speculation if actually what is the uh, ultimate limit that we can achieve with the current technology? Well, the entangled photon creation, we already have a really uh, uh, bright source, which is much stronger than what uh, the literature suggests, because we are checking with this camera, not the single mode fibers coupled to the detectors. And uh, we can have this by source multiplexing. We can put lots of sources side to side and have really like bright source. That's no problem. That's not the technological limit. And the photon detector situation, again, we can put beam splitters and have lots of detectors side to side. And then they work in parallel. We can overcome the, this, this limitation. Timestamp resolution right now, what we have is like 80 picosecond, which is pretty good. It can even improve, but this is good enough already because the bottleneck is coming from somewhere else. It's the APD timing jitter. Uh, that's around a couple of uh, hundreds of picoseconds. Like, uh, in our case, it's like 300 picoseconds. Let me explain what it looks like here. OK, so the thing is, when a photon comes at time 0, time t, t is equal to 0 here at the detector's active area, it takes some delay until we detect that pulse, OK? Or the digital pulse is created. But that is not constant. It, takes, it goes back and forth. It's a distribution. And that distribution means if these two photons are really close to each other, the previous one can go be, be, like in front of the other one. Then if you're looking for entanglement correlations, we will see something wrong. On the other hand, if you're looking for uh, coincidences in the cross-correlation function, you will miss this uh, coincidence, which means even if there is something in front of you, you will not be able to see it. So that's why like this 300 picosecond, how do we get this 300 picosecond, by the way, from this picture? So if you look at this peak, it's not like one point. The, co the, the coincidence is not having a peak in one point. It's a distribution. It's because photons are like moving back and forth. That's called timing jitter. In Turkish, it's zaman titreşimi, zaman sal titreşimi. So they, they go back and forth. Because of that, you're losing some photons. Or the, the coincidence might be a little bit back, back or forth, sorry, back uh, before or after where it's supposed to be. Because of that, we see some peak like this. If these photons are too many, if they come closer to each other, with the Poissonian distribution, then basically you may lose the correlations. Because of that, the, uh, the limitation is coming from this APD timing jitter. Uh, there are some other problems like weather conditions, stealth materials, and tracking moving, moving objects. Uh, for, all of, so for, for, for these two, for weather conditions and stealth materials, wavelength multiplexing can be used. Basically, we can change the crystal angle and then define what, ang uh, sorry, what wavelengths we want for the signal and idler beams. We can engineer that. So that's no problem. But trying to move in objects, uh, there are two things that we can do for that. We use pulse lasers, and then see how much are the pulses having this uh, relativistic delays or uh, time dilation uh, or contraction in this case. So both can happen if the source is coming towards our, or us or the other way around. So because of that, uh, the pulses are going to have some uh, delays, or they will contract in time. Or we can use some Doppler shift uh, laser <laughs> Uh, de uh, dedicate some of the entangled photons for checking the spectrum. From there, we can see how much the wavelength is shifted from the Doppler shift, which is similar to the uh, classical radars. So basically, with these current limitations, uh, uh, 10 giga pairs per second entangled photon rate gives us around like 300 meters. Beyond uh, 300 meters, you will have a coincidence rate of less than 100, uh, uh, 100 uh, coincidence rate. Here, what we use is like a black anodized aluminum, which is something very similar. You can, uh, simple. You can find in the laboratories because in the optics laboratories, you don't want any reflections. You don't want the photons to scatter around. That will destroy your quantum correlations. That's why these uh, materials are coated with the black anodized. So that's what we used here. And well, what can be done is. Um, so basically, well, we, we, if we can have this wavelength multiplexing multi, uh, techniques, use multiple sources with different wavelengths, we can go up to like one kilometer with this technique. And then there's something else called ghost imaging, quantum ghost imaging. Well, entangled photons uh, are created with the spontaneous parametric down conversion process. We talked about the momentum conservations. If they are going collinear, they are collinear. If the, one of them has angle, the other one has to have some similar angle so that their momentum is conserved. We can use these momentum co uh, uh, correlations for getting the two-dimensional image of this uh, object. And the third dimension is coming. So there are some corrugations in the surface. So the photon reflected from this point will travel more path 
than this point. So that gives some third dimension uh, from the uh, uh, cross correlation functions. We can check all these things to get the 3D image of the uh, object. So that's, that's my friend from Singapore. So, yeah. I have a question regarding the last part of your talk. I thought the point of the quantum illumination of quantum radar is not that you just can just detect the target by means of one second yeah. photon entangled pair, but rather that you have advantage compared to, say, detection with coherent states. OK. Do you see that? Uh, so here, uh, well, in this experimental setup, the, the, the advantage, let's say, with respect to the cl classical radar is uh, Basically, you can check if the photons that are coming to your detector is legitimate photons coming from the object, or somebody is trying to spoof us. So we can check that with the entanglement, violation of Bell's inequality. Uh, if the object doesn't have some certain, well, with certain techniques that can be also changed because the polarization can be shifted, you can put some coat the object with some material that is having some halfway plate. Let's say you can change the polarization. If you don't do that, whatever is coming backwards is like having the same polarization, linear polarization. Then you can check the entanglement correlations, violation of Bell's inequality. That tells us if somebody is trying to spoof us or those are the photons that we have the twins as reference in the laboratory. The other uh, advantage is that we are working in the single photon level. Okay, and uh, which is hard to detect because we are working in the single photon level. Uh, the, the, the analogy can be done to the LIDAR, actually. LIDAR is closer to this technique. So with LIDAR, you're sending actually laser pulses, which can be detected. Here we are working with the single photons, hard to detect. Uh, even if the, 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 the other party detects, cannot spoof. Well, I mean, you can reduce coherent states, but... Yes, numbers. yes, yes, you can still do. But the problem is, uh, still, the, the, you cannot prevent the spoofing attacks. Yeah, if, if somebody can detect, even if low level, uh, they can send the similar pulses to, and do the spoofing, so that as if the, the, the object is going somewhere else. But here, we know our photons with the laws of quantum mechanics, the violation of Bell's inequality. So that's the advantage. It's not a quantum radar. I use the term, I, I try to explain. Radar because I don't know what to say. It's not radio frequency. We are working with the near infrared, yeah. So. But there are also experiments uh, uh, parallelly being done in Austria. Uh, they are uh, having the photons, entangled photons in the microwave region. So that's a different experiment. But there are some problems with that as well, like conversion efficiency or like the, the, the brightness is really low and stuff like that. I said, Lloyd, I think uh, there is a paper that he claims that even if we do not uh, get uh, observed the uh, reflected uh, entangled photon, it can uh, again enhance our radar. Uh, do you deal with such China says that, right? Satelloid. I no. It's, okay, that that's a really nice question. I get, keep getting the same question actually. Uh, so it's the same thing. I mean, in this proposal, they say that like we say, we measure these photons. If this photon like hit to some object, you can understand it here. No, the, the entanglement doesn't work that way. Entanglement doesn't work that way. It has to be measured in the same polarization axis. We are talking about polarization entanglement here, and then the timing of the photons should be recorded. If you know nothing about the other photon, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. I don't so, think. Uh, ghost imaging is uh, relating to that, or is it not? No, no. Ghost imaging works like this. I mean, in this picture, I didn't have time. That's why I didn't talk too much. So let's say there's a photon. We, send, we measured one photon with a camera and record the position of the, 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 the photo, uh, pixel where the photon hit, OK? We record the timing of it and the position of the, the, the address of the pixel, OK? Then we send some, like the, the, the twin photon goes this way, and then it hits and comes back. This one is a bucket detector. Uh, where is it? OK. OK, here. So this one is a bucket detector. It comes here. Bucket detector means that either there is photon or no photon. We just know the timings. But from the time correlations, we know where the twin of this photon on this pixel. Which pixel is that? Then by looking at the co uh, coincidences, you can have the two dimension, let's say, silhouette of the object. Two dimension information is coming from this part. And the delay that you have is telling you the depth information. And the timestamp units, time resolution, which is 80 picosecond, tells you like 2.5 centimeters. Yes, 2.5 centimeters uh, uh, resolution in depth. So basically, you can get the image of this 3D object, 3D image of the object. That's how it works. <laughs>
Thank you all of our speakers today.